So thank you very much for being here. And I would try to summarize three things that we should keep in mind when we are using non-invasive respiratory support in COVID-19 patients. These are my conflicts of interest. And I also have my own bias, which is that I work in a hospital in Barcelona, which since 2007, we have been using high flow much more frequently than NIV. So I have to recognize my bias. Um, well, before the COVID co came, we had 66 ICU beds, but uh, during the first wave, we increased our ICU bed capacity up, up to 200 beds. And this allowed us to treat uh, during the first wave, 342 patients and to admit also those patients who were treated with high flow and were more at risk to be intubated. In fact, we almost treat 150 patients with high flow before uh, starting invasive mechanical ventilation. And in fact, we only had to start this therapy in 34 of these patients, which are which is more or less the 50% of the patients that we treat with high flow. So this is the uh, structure of the of my of my talk. Very easy. The first, the second, and the third thing. And uh, if we look to the uh, guidelines regarding the recommendation of the use of high flow or NIB, are sometimes confusing, and even they could uh, send us uh, different and opposite. Uh, message, in particular in regarding the use of NIV. But I would say, as a first thing, that the benefits and harms of non-respiratory supportive therapies in COVID-19 patients might not be different to those previously described in other types of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And in this figure, you can very nicely uh, show which are the effects, the physiological effects of high flow. I have to say that all the effects are flow dependent, which means that the higher the flow, the higher the effect you have. And the main difference of, the, of high flow compared with other techniques is that it's extremely comfortable. Despite all these mechanisms, the relative contribution of each one is still unknown. And the effect of high flow is highly heterogenic and varies among patients and varies in the same patient in two different times. What, is, what seems very clear is that high flow may interrupt the vicious circle of patient self-inflected lung injury at different levels. It may decrease esophageal pressure swings, it may improve gas exchange, it may decrease respiratory drive, and at some point, and in some patients, it may interrupt this circle and avoid the need for mechanical ventilation. What as I told you uh, a couple of slides before, the main difference compared with all other techniques that I have tested is that it's extremely comfortable for the patient and easy to use for the healthcare workers. But we have to keep in mind that higher flows are not more are more likely to be not tolerated, especially at the beginning of the technique. However, the comfort is a dynamic concept and the patient might be more comfortable with uh, longer use of high flow. So we will have to continuously titrate the flow to obtain with the maximum tolerated flow to obtain the, mind, the maximum effect and to try to keep the patient on high flow much the, 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 the more time possible. There are few um, encouraging uh, studies that have been published about the use of high flow in COVID-19. This is a, a, a propensity score matched analysis of some patients admitted in, if I'm not wrong, five, page, five different hospitals in Paris uh, by Alex de Moul that was published in the Bull Journal last month. They match almost 140 patients treated with high flow with other 140 non-treated with high flow. And they observe that high flow was associated with a reduced proportion of patients requiring invasive mechanical ventilation at day five. In fact, high flow patients require mechanical ventilation 55% of them, which is very similar to the percentage that I show at the beginning. 
And again, there were no difference in mortality as happened with the floral study and it's, um, let's say, um, it's, it could happen because uh, mortality may be related with some other factors, especially in COVID-19 patients that present a lot of different complications like thrombosis or super infections. Another interesting figure that has been recently published by the Reva Network in intensive care medicine is this one that you can find in the supplementary material of the paper. And you can see how the different uh, behaviors evolve during the first wave. At the beginning, we were a little bit afraid of using high flow or NIV, but as the pandemic evolves, the use of high flow and NIV was increased and it was related with a decrease of the need of mechanical ventilation and even mortality. Of course, I'm not saying that this was only related with the use of high flow or NIV, because as the pandemic evolved, we also know that we should not use the, uh, some treatments and maybe you should use steroids, but, but I'm sure that this is part of the effect that we observe in the need of mechanical ventilation. And remember that a ventilator was a very precious device during the pandemic. NIV has also some benefits that I'm sure that all of you know, but I want to remember that in terms of hypoxemic respiratory failure, the novo hypoxemic respiratory failure, ERG and ATS guidelines could not provide any recommendation due to the lack of evidence. Uh, I only say that if you use, you have to be very cautious in uh, monitoring exhale tidal volume. It's very difficult to control uh, the uh, tidal volume provided to the patient due to the high respiratory drive and uh, uh, even, do, even though you use low levels of pressure support. And it is important because these high tidal volumes have been associated with NIV failure or even higher mortality. And this monitoring is maybe a limitation of a uh, um, helmet interface, even though helmet interface has a lot of benefits as we will see in the next slide. And coming back to the previous slide of the vicious circle of patient self-inflected lung injury, NIV, at least face mask NIV, could even increase the pre-existing lung injury in some patients. So we have to be very, very, very cautious with, with its use. And I know that uh, there has been some controversies been between Luciano Gattinoni and Martin Tobin regarding the existence or not of a patient self-inflected lung injury. But I want to show you some data that suggests that it might be possible. Here you have some patients treated with NIV monitor with an esophageal catheter, and here you have the esophageal swing, and you can see that those patients who succeed with NIV present a decrease in esophageal uh, swing, which means an a decrease in inspiratory effort, maintaining the same transpulmonary pressure. By contrast, all the patients who fail presented uh, no changes in esophageal uh, swing, which means that they keep on the same inspiratory effort that they had before initiating an IV, and they increase transpulmonary pressure, which may increase the pre-existing lung injury. Another um, indirect data of the existence of, of, of patient self-inflected lung injuries presented in this study that has been recently published in the Blood Journal. They were patients who were switched, they were mechanically ventilated and they're switched to pressure support. They were COVID-19 patients. And as you can see, those patients who present a high respiratory drive were more at risk of uh, relapse of the pre-existing lung injury and going back to assisted control ventilation. Uh, I talked about the helmet before. I think that this is a uh, very, uh, I think that the Italians show us how to do it and, and they, we have a lot of uh, to learn of them. 
uh, about the use of helmet. This is a, a, a physiological study uh, performed by the Domenico Luca Grieco and, and the group of Massimo Antonelli, and they compare high flow, the effects of high flow with, with helmet and IV. And as you can see, helmet in IV was associated with a better oxygenation, a more de a higher decrease in respiratory rate, and less dyspnea feeling. But more importantly, and we have talking about the, the esophageal uh, decrease by high flow, but, but compared with NIV, the decrease in this esophageal pressure swing was even greater with no changes in the transpulmonary pressure that we uh, had. So if we go back then to, for third time to the, the, the vicious circle of the patient self-inflected lung injury, and we had previously said that high flow was uh, a good technique in order to interrupt this, this circle, maybe helmet is, could be even, even uh, better. And maybe this partially explained the results of this single center uh, study of the group of John Kress in Chicago that performed in ARDS patients where helmet NIV uh, uh, was associated with a higher survival, survival compared with those patients who were treated with face mask NIV. The second thing that I want to ask you or that I want to talk about uh, is about the concern of is there is an additional risk of viral transmission to healthcare personnel when using non-invasive supportive therapies. Well, the first data that we have when the pandemic starts is related to SARS-1. And what we know, what we knew then is that high flow was not associated with a higher risk of uh, transmission to healthcare workers, which is not the same situation that face mask and IV and tracking intubation had at that time. And it is clearly explained or partially explained if we take into account the uh, exhale smoke dispersion of different oxygen devices. Here you can see the dispersion distance of different flows with high flow compared with conventional oxygen and with high flow even is less the dispersion that we have. But what I strongly recommend is, recommend is that if you are using high flow, you may uh, put a surgical mask on the top of the cannula of your patient. And this is clearly shown in the figure that you have on the right of the, of the slide here. There are different flows, 46, and even with uh, uh, no kind of respiratory supportive therapy. And you can clearly see the amount of exhaled smoke dispersion, which is completely avoided with the use of surgical mask. But it is not important it is not only important in terms of healthcare personal transmission, but also in terms of oxygenation. This has been recently published in Annals of Intensive Care. And as you can see, when you place a surgical mask on the top of the cannula, oxygenation clearly improves and it clearly drops the, SPO, the SPO2 when you remove the, the, the surgical mask. So at this point, at this point, it could also be beneficial. And what happens with helmet? Helmet, the, the leaks that we have with helmet are completely different than, than the ones that we have with face mask and IV. And I would compare helmet in terms of uh, a smoke dispersion uh, to the smoke dispersion that we have uh, uh, with uh, high flow and a surgical mask on the top, even when you are using high level of inspiratory and expiratory pressure. So it seems at least as safe as high flow and surgical mask. And in fact, in the studies that we have with, about with SARS-CoV-2, the environmental contamination was not associated with the day of illness, the ventilatory mode, or different aerosol generating procedures, or even viral load. So it is not clear. And my last slide about this issue is this 
a very elegant study that compared different uh, respiratory supports from uh, room air, nasal cannula, face mask, high flow at different flows, and NIV with different settings in 10 healthy volunteers inside a negative pressure rooms. And what we can see is that oxygen delivery modalities, and I mean high flow or NIV, do not increase aerosol generation. What increase aerosol generation is coughing or changing in respiratory patterns, especially those particles that were uh, smaller. The third thing which I think that is important is that early intubation in those patients who fail may be associated with better outcomes. And it, in other words, late intubation is associated with worse outcomes. But I don't, I don't like the, 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 the word late. I would say delayed intubation rather than, rather than late because they are slightly different. But it has been shown in NIV uh, some years ago, it has been uh, again shown in patients with high flu. Uh, so it is very important to monitor very closely this patient. Here there are two patients with two lower pneumonias, one in the left lung, one in the right lung with the same SpO2, FiO2. But if we look to the patients, they look extremely different. One is intubated for aspirative pneumonia monitored with EIT, uh, treated with NO, with esophageal pressure, and the other one only brings a uh, SpO2 um, uh, measurement and, and, and non-invasive arterial pressure. I'm not saying that this patient needs more monitor than that. I'm saying that this patient is severe and we have to look at him in order to detect any clinical deterioration as early as we can. And there are a lot of variables associated with high flow failure. I, go, I will not go deeply on that because I, I know that you, you, you probably know them, but I will only want to show some data about the ROCS index for high flow, which I, we defined a, few, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was defined as the ratio between SpO2 and FiO2 and respiratory rate. And interestingly, it outperformed the diagnostic accuracy of these two variables separately. In fact, a ROBS index above 4.88 at 2, 6 or 12 hours after high flow onset was consistently associated with a lower risk of mechanical ventilation, even after adjusting for potential confounding. But we also define some thresholds for failure, not only for those patients who are going to do well with high flu. And these thresholds were highly, highly, highly specific at different time points. So between the threshold of no risk and the, and the threshold of high risk of intubation, there is obviously a gray zone. And um, for you, the, the, the amount of patients that are in this gray zone is relatively low, only on 11% of the entire core that we had on the valid uh, ROCS validation study. And the intubation rate of this 11% of the patients was more or less the same that the rest of the core had. But what we have to do with these patients? So if you reassess the ROCS index and you calculate the delta ROCS, you will see that is also different between those patients who succeed where the delta rocks increase after over over time or those patients who fail in uh, because these patients the delta rocks remains constant or even decrease but the obvious question that arises is what occurs first the traditional criteria or the rocks criteria because if they are at the same time the rocks does not provide any benefit and here you have represented the percentage of patients that did not meet the traditional criteria for intubation, and they had a respiratory rate below 35, but they, may, they met the ROCS criteria for intubation at two, at six, and at 12 hours. What happened with these patients that were not intubated at two, at six, and at 12 hours because they didn't meet the traditional criteria? almost 90% of the patients were finally intubated. So if we had used the ROCS criteria, you, we had intubated them earlier. 
And the other obvious question is, is 12 hours a safe zone to be sure that uh, you are uh, not uh, delaying a needed intubation? And the only way that we had to test it is compare the relative risk of death at different uh, times, taking as a reference the mortality of the patients that were intubated within the first six hours. And what we observed is that at least uh, before these 12 hours, there is no additional risk related with the time of intubation. So the proposed algorithm with the data that we have, and it's an algorithm that we are going to test in a randomized control trial, is this one. The algorithm is exactly the same at two, six, and at 12 hours, and the only difference is the threshold that you have to use to consider intubate the patient. If the patient is in the gray zone, you always have to increase the support and reevaluate in 30 minutes and then calculate the delta rocks. And according to the result of the delta rocks, you always take the decision to intubate if there is no improvement or you can keep the patient on high flow if there is some kind of improvement. Interestingly, the rocks index has also been tested in COVID-19 patients, and the threshold is more or less the same. Remember that there is the respiratory rate of COVID-19 patients is probably slightly lower than the patients with bacterial pneumonia, and this feeling of dyspnea, it's more or less, uh, the, the, the concept of hap happy hypoxemia came uh, at the beginning of the, of the, of the pandemic, and, and, and maybe, this slight difference in the threshold are due to this fact. But if you don't want to go to the index, you can also uh, look at the um, separate variables because oxygenation has, al has also been related with a higher uh, incidence of failure of high flow. And if you look to respiratory rate, uh, per separate, you all, you always, you also will find uh, um, similar results uh, that the ones uh, that you observe with drugs. Interestingly, the thresholds that have been described here uh, with uh, COVID-19 patients are uh, very similar to the ones that we describe in non-COVID patients. And what happens with NIV? With NAV, we can use the HACOR score. The HACOR score is a composite score uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, calculated using the heart rate, the pH, the Glasgow Coma score, the PaO2, FiO2, and the respiratory rate. And as you can see, those patients who fail had a higher HACOR score compared to those patients who succeed. And the authors describe a put off of five to predict those patients who fail. And when they compare those patients who had a HACOR score higher than five after one hour of NIV, and they compare those who were intubated early versus late intubation, taking as a cutoff the 12 hours, they observed that those patients who were intubated lately had a higher mortality. So it seems that is a score that is um, that is very that could be very useful in NIV uh, patients, but I, uh, of course the the use of of, of different kinds of uh, non-invasive supportive therapies is uh, most of times limited by the availability in terms of a pandemic. But my recommendation would be that the intubation criteria would be clearly predefined before starting the non-invasive respiratory therapy in order to not delay any intubation in those patients who are going to fail. And there are several unresolved issues that I don't have the answer, such as if there is any technique superior to, the, to other in terms of need of mechanical ventilation or mortality, which patients would benefit the most, the right moment to escalate the therapy, or even the real effectiveness of awake proning, something that we have done, but uh, I could not address uh, in this talk uh, due to a question of, of, of time. So in summary, I, I would like to summarize that uh, some patients with COVID-19 may benefit from non-invasive supportive therapies. Uh, 
Data regarding the risk of viral transmission to healthcare workers is scarce. However, when you use non-invasive supportive therapy, you may you, uh, the use of adequate PPE and EPA filters in NIV are uh, uh, mandatory. And these patients supported with non-invasive supportive therapy need to be closely monitored to detect as early as possible any clinical deterioration. Thank you very much, and I would be very happy to take any questions.